Face of an angel. You know a man could have a face of an angel. Okay. That was great. Excellent presentations. You you were very well prepared. You said exactly, and then you you said exactly what you had prepared to say very well. And it was full of good meat and thought. And so thank you very much. That's excellent. Okay, so let's continue in our study tonight on the Donatists. And I'm very intrigued by the Donatists. And I did a little bit of reading outside of our book as well about the Donatists because I didn't feel that our author represents them properly. If you look in your book, and I'll show you what I mean. So basically, and, and we read this section last week, so we won't read it again. But basically what happened is this, is that when the persecution of, Di of um, Diocletian happened, this last persecution from like 303 to about 312, and then it was stopped by Constantine. Then the church had to sort out everything. And a lot of the leaders and bishops even in the church had surrendered the word of God to the authority so that they wouldn't be persecuted. Meanwhile, other people died for their faith. Some of the leaders in the church and members as well worshiped to the pagan idols, whereas others stood strong and confessed Christ and, and they were persecuted and suffered and died some for their faith. So then when they went to elect or to, to uh, install a new bishop of this area in Northern Africa, and this is where this controversy happened in North Africa, they installed a man named Sicilian, and the thing is with his ordination to become the bishop is a traitor is the one who laid his hands on Sicilian. And that traitor who had surrendered the word of God or worshiped the pagan idols, he had never gone through any discipline. He just continued on as if nothing happened. And so other Christians said, no, this isn't right. And first there was another uh, man before Donatus, but he died shortly after. But then the, the movement really took its name after Donatus, who became then the, the bishop who got installed by the believers who believed that, that these traitors did not have the authority to ordain and install other people into the ministry. So that's kind of where it started, is that basically Sicilian was consecrated by a traitor. So then the Donatus said, Whoever Sicilian then ordains or consecrates into the ministry, they're not qualified for the ministry. Or, and if they, and if Sicilian puts somebody into the ministry and they baptize somebody, that baptism doesn't have validity. Or if somebody takes the Lord's Supper in Sicilian's church, that's not really the, the true table of the Lord. So it's really a matter of, it wasn't a matter of the doctrine of Christ, it was more a matter of church discipline. <laughs> and church purity, and the authority of the local church came into question. So basically, the Donatus said that Sicilian did not have the authority from God. But meanwhile, Constantine said he did. <laughs> and meanwhile, Constantine was giving tax breaks to Sicilian and to that part of the church and giving them governmental favors and he had the support of, of Constantine, the emperor of Rome, and the Donatists didn't. So it, it became a huge controversy for, hundred, for a thousand years. Now, what I don't like what the book says is he says in uh, page 101, on page 101, when he talks about Donatism, as he said, Donatus argued that the failure to remain true during persecution invalidated the power of Felix to ordain. So it was this Felix who was the traitor, and he ordained this man, Sicilian, to become the bishop of the church. 
in Carthage. And that, and that, but he says that because he had thus committed an unpardonable sin. So in the reading I did, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but in the reading I did, I did not think that was a fair assessment based on what I read elsewhere. Because what does that make the Donatists seem like? That if somebody had not been faithful in a moment of trial, that he had committed an unpardonable sin, what does that make the Donatists appear? Catholic, uh, Catholic and that's not what I, I was, I was that, in other words, if somebody commits a sin to label it unpardonable, you cannot be, so they were looking at the Donatists as very unforgiving, as harsh, as, as not like saying, hey, let's work through this. But, but to me, it's not that the Donatists were not willing to forgive. It's that they wanted there to be discipline. And they did say, if you have been a traitor, you can't just continue in the ministry. You have to repent, and then you have to renounce what you did and then get baptized again. Because maybe you did it because you weren't even saved. So they did want rebaptism in some. And again, it's easy for us. This is a long time ago, and the history is so sketchy. So it's, it's hard to know all the, the details of this, you know, because it happened so long ago. But I, I feel that the author sides more with the, um, the, the established church here. Okay, now, and really what, what this goes to as well, I want to read a couple verses. So let me, let me bring in our, our uh, people there out there on Zoom. So let me get uh, Kerry. Could you read for us, Kerry, in Romans chapter 15? And if we could all turn there, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 16. And Romans chapter 16 and verse um, 17 and 18, Kerry. And then I'm going to ask um, Charlie. Charlie, could you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 through 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 18. And here's where, and here's why we're going to read these scriptures. Does the Bible teach that at times you have to separate yourself? Yeah. Because really what the established church, the position they ultimately took with the Donatists is that they, their sin was in schism from the established church. Because the only way to receive forgiveness and to, re and to have Christ was to stay in that church. There was no forgiveness and no Christ outside of that church. Now, now what does that sound like to you? That sounds like what church? The Roman Catholic Church. Because that's what we're... That's what we're going to see forming here in the established church. Now coming under the sway of the worldliness of the Roman Empire and the pomp and the, the money and the power of, of the Roman Empire that Constantine is showering them with favors. Constantine is building them churches. Constantine is still a pagan. And we'll see that. It's not like he's just a full-born Christian. He's still worshiping pagan gods when that's convenient. And he's building Christian churches when that's convenient. He's a politician, really, is what Constantine is. Um, so, but the point is, is that sometimes there needs to be separation. So let's read those scriptures. Kerry, could you read Romans chapter 16, that passage I asked? And then, Charlie, you could follow that right up and go right to the Second Corinthians passage. Sure, Pastor. Romans 16, 17, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 18, and they read, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay. And Charlie, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 down to 18. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right, 2 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come up, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay, so perhaps the Donatists came across principles like this and, and believed that the behavior of Felix, who was a traitor, and then he was ordaining or consecrating men into ministry when he had not been faithful, that he was acting more like an unbeliever, that their fellowship with the church would have been an unequal yoke with unrighteousness. And, and so they, they separated. Okay, so, um, so if you go back to your uh, notes that I gave you on the Donatists, I won't reread everything there. But I will just review, and I do want you to know this, that the first real separatist group were the Montanists. And who was the key leader of the Montanists? A man named Tertullian. And that's at the top. That's the first blank there. And I do want you, you, you Tertullian is in our notes later on as well, that he joined the Montanists. So that happened before this. But then we are saying that the Donatists do have a lot of similar characteristics of, of Baptists. I'm not saying that they're ideal in, in all their doctrine and are completely what we believe. I'm not uh, absolutely sure about it, you know, because again, some of this history is sketchy, but they did immerse believers. They did endure martyrdom. They did seek purity in the church. And they believed in a regenerated church membership. So that's the blank at the bottom of that first page. And then on the top of page two there, they strove for personal and church purity. And they had a high view of the authority of scripture. That's why, that, that's why this thing happened in the first place, right? Because they did not surrender the word of God. They believed in the word of God and they would die for the word of God. So they had a high view of the authority of scripture. They baptized believers by immersion. And Augustine will attack the Donatist position because Augustine would baptize infants. The Donatists stood against what I'm saying there. Augustine attacked the Donatist position against infant baptism. The Donatists were against infant baptism. I don't know if that's so clear. Forgive my grammar. It's not the best sometimes. But the Donatists were against infant baptism, and Augustine attacked them for that. So, and, and then, and again, this wasn't happening like, this was like a, it, it was happening, but I don't know if you were living through it, whether you would see it happening as clearly. But, well, well what, what was clear is that Christians were being persecuted by Diocletian and then Constantine, and we'll talk more about Constantine. But he, he allegedly saw that vision in the sky and then began to go basically conquer in the name of Jesus Christ. And he became the empire. He became the, the, the ruler over the entire Roman Empire. Eventually, he had to, the, things had to work out. But and then he really united the different pagan religions as well as the church under his authority. And he worked with them all. And. The, the established church then became favored by the Roman Empire, and it was really the first marriage then in the history of the church between the church and the state. And that is never a good thing, where the, the state relies on, I mean, where the church relies on the state or the government for, you know, its funding or for it's building churches, you know, that the, we don't want the government to build our church because then guess who controls us? The government will control us, right? So they believed that the union between church and state affected by Constantine was dangerous to the purity of the church. 
Constantine saw himself, as I said, this is where I think I finished last week, as the Pontifex Maximus. Now, that is a phrase that was used before, the, before that, that when, when he was just over all the pagan religions. The Pontifex Maximus means the builder of the bridge, the high priest of all high priests. That Constantine saw himself, and this is before he saw the vision in the sky, before he, so, so to speak, made a profession of faith as a Christian, became a Christian, so to speak. And I don't believe actually he was a Christian. I do not believe Constantine was a Christian. But before he saw that vision, he saw himself as the Pontifex Maximus. <laughs> no, he was the Roman emperor and they saw themselves as deity. It's just power. It's human power. So uh, Angelica said, was he mentally ill? I'm, I'm not here to really evaluate his mental state, but it's just that he, well, most, most men who are in positions like that are very narcissistic, very, have, they're very full of themselves. So, okay. So, so basically though, the point I was making is after when he, when he, so to speak, made some kind of, when he did believe in the power of Jesus Christ, I'm going to put it that way. He didn't believe in the power of Jesus Christ to save him, but he believed that Jesus Christ had some kind of power. But he also believed that pagan gods had some kind of power too. So he just kind of added Jesus to his God shelf. And so he gave credibility to Christ in that sense. But he still saw himself as the, the head over all the religions of the empire, the church, as well as the pagan religions. And that never changed to the day of his death. And on his deathbed, you remember what he did, right? He got baptized. So he never put himself under the authority of any church or any church leader or any bishop throughout his life. That's why he didn't get baptized. He knew if he got baptized, he'd have to put himself under the authority of the church. He didn't want to do that. He's over the church. He's the first pontiff, which is what they call the Pope today. You know, that's one of the names that they call the Pope, the pontiff. So this is really, in Constantine, I believe we see the real beginnings of the Roman Catholic system. So it was, so Constantine ruled against the Donatists. The Donatists stood for religious liberty. Okay, let me continue now. Number six. The Donatists believed the church was a community of holy people and of saints. The established church emphasized the holiness of the church apart from purity of its clergy or members, but in its sacraments. So they saw the holiness of the church, the established church, and they saw the holiness of the church in the sacraments, not in the bishops, not in the members of the church, because they reasoned. We all are sinners. So, you know, and, and this makes some kind of reasonable sense. In other words, they said that this guy who was a traitor, who, you know, laid his hands and consecrated Sicilian. Well, if you say that if, if a pastor has sinned and he gives the Lord's Supper and baptizes, does his baptism have authority? If, a, if let's say the pastor did something he shouldn't do. We all do things we shouldn't do. Does that, so does that mean my baptism wouldn't have authority? So they kind of argued along those lines. But this, is, this was a serious issue that required discipline, is the point. But just think of that now. And this is, this is the reasoning of the Catholics today. Pretty much anybody can go into a Catholic church. And if you go to the priest and confess your sins, you could take the, 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 mass, the mass, the wafer, and they'll say, you received Christ. They don't really counsel you and they don't discipline past sins or present sins or future sins. There's no discipline in the Catholic Church. Really, I mean, sometimes, well, after all, I shouldn't say there's no discipline. They did finally discipline some of these terrible perversions that were going on in the priesthood, but it took them a long time to even do that, right? You know, they were actually, there's a lot of evidence that the Catholic Church, when a, a priest came out that he was doing something awful, some kind of terrible abuse, they would just move them to another place. Yeah. You know, that, that was going on. They had no real internal controls to stop it for a long, long time. Maybe they, they're doing more about it. But 
the point is, is that the Catholic Church does not emphasize discipline. And that's what, what's going on here. Why? Because they see the holiness of the church is not in the people in the church or in the leadership of the church. The holiness of the church, this is big, actually. The holiness of the church is in its what? Sacrament is holy. The church is holy because it has the succession back to Jesus Christ. Jesus is holy. But what are we called in the Bible? We are called what? Saints. Who are saints? Holy ones. That's what a saint is, a holy one. We're supposed to all be holy in Jesus Christ. Okay. So they resisted. I say they, the they is always referring to the Donatists. The Donatists resisted the growing worldliness and paganizing of the established church as the established church embraced people in mass without true conversion. So ritual, ritualism, and the sacraments replaced true salvation, and the church became corrupt by uniting with the governing power of the empire under Constantine. And, and I put over time. This is not like happened immediately, if you will. But basically, though, by 300, infant baptism had been established, forgiveness of sins. You know, you put a little water on the baby, their sins are taken away, they're regenerated. That was actually, uh, there was one of the early church leaders, Justin Martyr, actually said that, that uh, the bap baptism regenerates. So, so, in other words, salvation became more of ritual than a personal experience of, through the new birth. And so after, when Constantine legalized Christianity, pagan worldly people just started to flood into the church without true conversion. And they brought their pagan ideas with them of worshiping, uh, you, you know, saints, uh, or not uh, worship, worshiping all kinds of gods. And I believe that's why the Catholic Church started to, you know, kind of Christianize the paganism by worshiping Mary and saints and other things. So the church just became flooded with worldliness. So again, the Donatists, it wasn't just that they were being stubborn and unforgiving and judgmental, calling them, oh, you're, you know, you committed the unpardonable sin and we never want to forgive you. It was a lot deeper than that. It was like the whole, everything that was going on in the empire. Just imagine that they were persecuted. Now they're not. And now people are becoming, coming into the church and, and the church is becoming very worldly. Ritual and the sacraments replace true salvation. Okay, any, any questions or comments, Esther? Okay, so the question is, is when somebody goes to the priest today and makes confession and he says, for penance, do seven Hail Marys and three Our Fathers or something like that. So I don't know exactly what was going on back then compared to what happens today in a Roman Catholic confessional. But I do know that the Roman Catholic system is very ritualistic and that there's, there's often not an understanding of true salvation. You've talked to Roman Catholics. I've talked to Roman Catholics. They say, I'm a Catholic. And a lot of Roman Catholics don't even know much of what the Catholic Church believes. Some do, but many don't. And they just do whatever the priest says and they think whatever. Or, you know, how many people, too, were baptized as babies in the Roman Catholic Church and they became, what, mafiosos or, you know, just terrible people? They weren't saved. The Catholic Church says you're born again. So anyway, the Catholic Church system through its sacraments is... is um, all weighted to the authority of the church and to the holiness of the church and to the holiness of their sacraments that they give to people and not to personal holiness. I, I always wondered why it was easy or very simple for Hindus to become Catholic and Catholics to become Hindus. And as you were talking about the rituals and the sacraments, I saw the connection. Oh, yeah. Them. So Liz said she, she sees a connection now between Hinduism and Roman Catholicism that it's ritualistic. So one can easily become the other. Hindus can become Catholics or vice versa, perhaps. Okay, so, so the Donatists were persecuted by the Catholics. Their property was confiscated. 
churches were closed. Augustine wrote, let them come to the true church. That is their Catholic mother. The church was being united with worldly political powers and was being corrupted. Now go to Corinth, page 152 here, was receiving its orders and power from the Roman government. The Tonitists believed that churches should separate from the established church that had become an ally of the empire. So there were deep issues at play. Okay, let's go to page 152, and then I'll just finish reading this, and we'll, we'll finish up for tonight. So on page 152 in your book, he mentions the Donatists in that the top paragraph. But what I want to um, read, you see where it says the growth of the liturgy there? I just want to read that first sentence or two. It says... And this is really the result of what happened with the union of Constantine that Constantine made between church and state. The practical union of the church and the state under Constantine and his successors led to the secularization of the church. In other words, the worldliness, right, of the church. The patriarch of Constantinople came under the control of the emperor. The patriarch of Constantinople, that sounds, what, who is that? The pastor, <laughs> the pastor of the church in Constantinople. Remember, Constantine, what he's also going to do is move the capital from Rome, and he's going to build basically a whole new city for himself called Constantinople. And so the bishop, the pastor of the church in Constantinople, who controlled him? Not God. Constantine. He came under the control of the emperor, and the Eastern Church became a department of the state. The influx of pagans into the church through the mass conversion movements of the era, and it says mass conversion, they weren't really converted. They just went into the Catholic Church to take their sacraments. Contribute to the paganization of worship as the church tried to make these barbarian converts feel at home within its fold. So there, I think the author gets it right about the. So that's what was going on that the Donatists were most reacting to. That's what was happening. And that's why I side with the Donatists. Okay, so let me just finish up. If you go back to the notes there, I want to just read this. In this controversy, the doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church was being developed. The defenders of the church offered salvation by means of sacraments, which they had the control. When I say the defenders of the church, the defenders of the established church, of Constantine's uh, state church way, and I'm talking about Augustine. Augustine made clear that the Catholic church alone is the body of Christ, which distributed the one true bread as the sacrament of unity. Ultimately, Augustine resorted to force to bring the Donatists back into the Catholic church, now, we've heard, you've heard about the Inquisitions, where the Catholic Church persecuted so many believers. Well, it was Augustine who really laid the foundation later on for the Inquisitions in the Middle Ages with this Donatist controversy. That's why this controversy is also so important, because Augustine gets in the middle of it, and the Catholic system is really being developed here during this period of time. So you have Constantine being a big part of that but this controversy and the separation of, of believers. So the church was transformed from a community of holy people into an inst institution that offered holy sacraments. So I'm, I'm emphasizing, does that make sense to you? The Catholic church, it's not that the people have to be holy. You don't have to live holy. In the, that's why you can drink and do all kinds of things and get drunk in the Catholic church. And you can just confess it, take the, the sacrament, and you're holy. Let's see, I'm getting close. Take it easy. <laughs> the Catholic Church was prepared to compromise with the evils of the world for the sake of unity. Keeping the church from schism was their top priority because the true church possessed a succession of bishops. To sever from the Catholic Church meant severance from the true church. Augustine wrote strongly against the Donatists. Any separation from the Catholic Church put the anger of God upon them outside the hope of salvation. That's how Catholics feel today. They are scared to death to leave the Catholic Church, many of them. Because they feel if they do, they're going to get the anger of God on them. And the only way they can receive Christ is in, in the Catholic Church. Because they alone can give out the holy sacraments. Okay, so that's 
that's how we got. Uh, so, you know, the thing about history is kind of understand how things got to be how they are. Okay. So this is a big moment in church. Okay. Any uh, questions as we uh, close tonight? Anything you want to say or comments? Any comments? Does it make sense? I hope it makes a little sense. Yeah. So Micah made a motion to change the name of our church to the Donatist, Hyper Donatist Baptist Church. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Uh, sir. Yes, Charlie. Uh, so I was just kind of curious. I know this is going back just a little bit. Um, when they use the word sacrament, did they use it interchangeably with ordinance or did they mean it as like actual something that uh, confers grace? By this point, they believed it conveyed grace by the time of, of this, this controversy. I mean, okay. definitely baptism. And yes, I, I believe they would say that from what the church, some what those early church fathers wrote, that that the that the, the the sacrament, the wafer was the literal body of Christ, and the juice was his literal blood. I believe they okay. they held to that at that point. Oh, Tim Stalcup, did you want to make a comment? Um, I. I, I didn't. Did I accidentally raise my hand or something? Oh, no. Uh, no, I thought uh, Micah said maybe you put something in the chat. Yes, yes. Um, what'd you put there? Because I'm not looking at the chats. Right. I, I just had shared that the two presentations were such a real encouragement to me tonight. I, I really needed to hear that as I, I had a very close personal friend uh, that uh, was named Stephen that was living in Baghdad, Iraq, independent fundamental Baptist preaching the word of God. And he was teaching English over there and being a witness. And uh, he's with the Lord now. Uh, just this evening, he, he took a bullet to the head, uh, escaped a kidnapping situation. But, um, but he was, he was a, a modern day martyr. And it was a good reminder tonight, uh, just uh, here in class, hearing about the faithfulness that has uh, been demonstrated ever since the beginning of the church and and just an encouragement thank you for sharing that brother i'm sorry how do you know is that do you know him from one of your trips over there he he led the trip that uh me and two other preachers went to afghanistan together All right stephen why don't you close us in prayer tonight tim and pray for his family and uh his friends okay Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God worth serving. We thank you that, that you know the beginning from the end. We thank you that you have given your life for us and that you have, you have given us eternal life. And, and now we, we thank you for the example of those who have been willing to serve you until the end and despite the difficulties that they might face. We thank you for the... Uh, for the examples of, of Stephen in the beginning of, of the church and his faithfulness and the example there. We thank you for the numerous ones who are faithful to you throughout the, the time, uh, as Brother Douglas shared, uh, at the beginning of, of the major wave of persecution there. And, and, and Lord, I, I thank you even for those who are have been faithful to you even in more recent times, uh, like Brother Stephen Trail, and and we ask a, a special grace on Jocelyn, his wife, and his three daughters, and his young son, that that they might uh, remain faithful to you, that they might not doubt you, but that they would find a grace in this time of difficulty. Bring them back to uh, the states safely in one piece. And may they have wisdom in the days ahead. Lord, I pray for those believers who have been meeting with Brother Stephen Trail in recent evenings and, and have, have been growing. Help them to have wisdom in how to grow. And, and may they be faithful to the word and faithful to you uh, in these days. We thank you for your love for us. I ask your blessing on each one in this class. Thank you for Pastor and his teaching. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you, brother. He's an American, this guy, Stephen. So he's yes. not.
Yes, he is. He, he was a Crown College graduate. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, well, we'll keep him in prayer. Could you email me the, his, his uh, name of his wife and kids, or if you know them, or can you email me a prayer request, and we'll put it on our prayer bulletin for Sunday, uh, Wednesday. Thank you. Yes, okay. I will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. Okay, good night, everyone. God bless you. Good night, Pastor. Thank you, and uh, good night to everyone on Zoom and in person. Thank you, Carrie. Good night. God bless you guys. Thank you for being there. We appreciate our Zoom attendance. You're very important to us. Good night. Bye. Okay, Stephanie. Good night. Hi, Pastor Matt. Good night. Okay. Lovely you. you. Yeah, nice to see you. A nice to see you too. <laughs> you don't want to see me now. <laughs> Really, really lovely message. Um, I, I learned a lot about the Catholic Church and um, yeah. what their modus operandi is. Have a very good night, everybody. Okay. God bless. Yeah, God bless you. This is the Debbie, my love. I will do it. I will. Okay. So